All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for, for joining. Um, we're going to give a couple minutes of, of our time for folks to, to jump in, um, but just wanted to say hello and thank you for being here at our very first community conversation. Um, as we wait for folks to trickle in, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat um, with your name and institution. And um, if you'd like to update your Zoom display name with your pronouns, um, that is also awesome. Um, and I think Mandy is going to drop a link in the chat to um, include the instructions for that as well. Awesome. Nice to see you all in the chat. Um, we are right at 102. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us. This is our first community conversation. Um, and so we're, we're very excited um, to have you all here and ready to kind of chat with our contributors and each other. Um, I want to remind everyone that automatic captioning has been enabled and you can turn that on um, using the show captions bot a button at the bottom of your screen. The beginning of today's session with the contributor presentation portion will be recorded. So that'll be available to you and we'll stop the recording before we jump into our group discussion. And before we dive in, we also wanted to provide some ground rules for this session. Um, so I'll run through these quickly and if you have um, suggestions or comments or questions, feel free to drop this in the chat. Um, but these are kind of our proposed ground rules. So the first, be here now. Um, I know it's, it's hard with everyone being so busy, but um, if you can avoid multitasking and kind of try to take advantage of this opportunity to be here and connect with colleagues. Second, we ask that you share airtime. So allowing everyone the opportunity to speak, especially in our breakout sessions. Third, foster mutual respect, use inclusive language, be mindful of power dynamics, social, professional, or otherwise, and how those might impact the conversation. And lastly, all ideas and questions welcome. We really want this to be a learning space and that is a vulnerable process. So we ask that you assume others positive intent and approach conversations with curiosity and openness. And lastly, before we dive into the good stuff, I'll just give a quick rundown of our agenda today. So we've got our welcome and introduction, which we're just about done with. And then we'll dive into our contributor panel. So we'll hear about OER adoption from Teresa Dooley, open pedagogy from Elaine Kay, Nicole Wilson, and Liz um, Chenevy and um, open publishing from Anita Walls. And then from the um, about the halfway mark, uh, we'll jump into breakout rooms and small group discussions. And we'll be dividing folks up by institution size. Um, and we'll give you some more details on that kind of as we get closer to that portion. And then we'll come back for a community debrief and closing remarks at the end. All right, so without further ado, um, oh, just kidding, sorry. Um, we are gonna start off um, just to kind of get your uh, brains working with a quick Menti prompt um, slash question. So Mandy's gonna drop the link in the chat um, to participate in the Menti and I will switch over our screens here. So we've got two questions for you. The first one is what is one area of your OER program that you'd most like to grow? faculty circles, open pedagogy, C degrees, another vote for open pedagogy. You're in the right place for today then. Outreach, assessment, department level PD for faculty, just to get started, absolutely. Visibility, student written OER, ancillary materials, Wow, awesome. So lots of lots of directions for sure. Um, and hopefully this uh, presentation today will give you some ideas for ways to move forward and to start to grow and scale. So thank you for that. Our second question um, is a multiple choice question. Um, oh, and the question text uh, is not showing up on the slide. I'm sorry about that. Um, so the question is, um, what uh, are, are the sort of the biggest barriers or challenges um, to growing your program? So what's holding you back at this moment? Faculty readiness or bandwidth time funding. Lots of votes for faculty readiness. Oh, we have a clear leader. I wasn't expecting that. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, definitely faculty readiness, a little bit of time, leadership buy-in and funding. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll hear a little bit about. Um, some of those challenges and, and ways that our colleagues have 
either creatively approached them or, or perhaps conquered them. Um, more to come on that. Well, thank you for, for sharing your input. Um, I'll come back here to our slides. Um, and without further ado, now the fun part, I will pass it off to hear about open pedagogy. Sorry, that's us. I didn't, I didn't realize we were going first, thought we were second. All right. Um, so my name is Elaine Kay. I'm an instructional designer um, at James Madison University in the libraries. And I have two other colleagues that um, we're presenting together today. So I don't know, Liz and Nicole, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourselves? Sure. I'm Liz Shenevy. I'm um, a librarian at, JM at JMU. I'm the health and behavioral studies librarian. And I'm Nicole Wilson. I'm also an instructional designer at JMU in the libraries. Um, okay, so in our time, we're sharing a bit about a fellowship that we uh, designed and implemented and how we think about scaling the work of open pedagogy and professional development for faculty. Um, so at our institution, the JMU libraries houses not only all of the traditional library services, but it also includes a unit which supports academic technologies and instructional design. The creation of the Opening Up Fellowship is an example of how this cross-disciplinary work um, is made possible because of our organizational structure um, and the fact that it's also part of a multifaceted uh, approach on our campus to create a culture of open that embraces relationships between open access, open educational resources, and open pedagogy. So the open educational librarian um, in our libraries, her name is Liz Thompson. She may be here today, um, I'm not sure, but she convenes and leads a working group of library, oh, there she is, libraries, faculty, and staff who engage in various aspects of this open work in an effort to have a more robust and holistic approach to open. Um, so we share that part of the story um, to get at our first bullet point on the slide, which is building diverse and collaborative partnerships. Um, building partnerships in our experience is critical when you're scaling or even developing faculty support. Um, we encourage you to imagine a group of folks, maybe from different parts of the university that you normally work with, to become your partners in this work. Uh, think about how this collaboration might help you diversify options for funding um, to support faculty as they're developing their open projects. Um, what are some grant opportunities that you might be able to find by having diverse collaborators um, to access uh, by framing the work of open pedagogy as curriculum development, course development, and faculty professional development. Um, so really, because we have that built into our institution, finding those spaces that you can have those partners to give you sort of a diverse and different spin on the programs you're trying to implement while it's still the same content. So, and I'm going to pass it on to Liz to give a little more info. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the fellowship. So we designed a fellowship for faculty to engage in um, and learn about open pedagogy and create some open pedagogy um, assignments and kind of weave it into some of their courses. And so our intention was to create a fellowship model that centered community building and was intentionally and flexibly designed to be a slow paced and supportive environment that fostered curiosity, exploration and growth. Um, this type of learning space allowed faculty participants to explore information literacy concepts, open pedagogy frameworks, and instructional design principles in an intellectually challenging way that included a deep reflection and a lot of community engagement. So this leads us to our second bullet point of being flexible to meet folks where they are. We knew that we had a mix of faculty with a variety of experience with open. Most of them knew what an OER was, but might not have adopted one yet, might not have really engaged deeply in the open landscape. And so because of this, we encouraged our participants to think of open as a spectrum and to embrace more of an ethos of open and not have to feel this pressure to make every open assignment fully open to the public. It could be open just within the class. 
Um, so to do this, we modeled a variety of open options and we made the program a blend of synchronous and asynchronous sessions that allowed participants to learn at their own pace. Um, and while we scaffolded these sessions because it was a fellowship that took place over the course of a year, we aim to design these sessions in a way where they can also be pulled out in a more modular way in other contexts um, and could also be used to support consultations with faculty or as a referral resource for faculty who are interested in learning more about open pedagogy. So really being flexible in our design to create um, resources that could be used in a variety of modes and ways was really helpful as well. And I'll pass it to Nicole to wrap us up about those resources. Thanks, Liz. Um, on our campus, the libraries is well known as a strong partner in the area of faculty development alongside partners like our Teaching and Learning Center and other groups with, within various colleges. Um, this unique organization of services provides us with a privileged perspective and access to resources that may not exist in the same way on other campuses or other educational settings. It's from the space of deep collaboration between lab liaison librarians and instructional designers that this program came to be, and also the reason we thought it was imperative to share the program structure, materials, and details through an openly licensed press book. Um, we encourage you, so this is our third point, we encourage you to use the press book as a starting place and then adapt it to your needs and possible partnerships. Consider if you could find a department or college that would be interested in this content and how could a program be adapted to connect with state level or institutional goals. And I think Mandy, yeah, thank you for putting the links in the chat. Awesome, thank you all so much. Um, and thanks Mandy again for dropping the links to the chat. We'll have um, the resources also to share out at the end of the session. So if you don't quite grab them, um, they'll be sent out after. And then we will jump into scaling OER publishing. Great, okay. Um... Hi, um, I'm Anita Walls. I'm the Assistant Director for Open Education and Scholarly Communication Librarian at Virginia Tech. I've been involved with OER here for over 10 years and I started here, I started here in 2013. Um, Virginia Tech is a research one institution. When I first started, people kept telling me I don't want to adopt. There wasn't a lot to adopt at that point anyway. People were always like, I want to write. So some of this is a little bit accidental, not how I intended to start out, what I intended to do, but um, it fits well at the institution. So I'm going to go through uh, a few different um, uh, a few different themes. Uh, this obviously is not comprehensive, but um, I want you to grab onto these uh, and and hold on to them for the discussion uh, for the breakout groups. Um, these are places where we can dig further. But um, so these six managing philosophy, publishing options, traditional versus innovative um, labor and tools are the ones um, that I'm going to be talking about today. So next slide, please. Uh, so managing. Um, uh, sorry, I don't have control of the slides. If you can go to the next one, that would be lovely. Um, when you're trying to scale something, um, this requires that you add additional resources and that you control the scope. Um, so like other tasks, you might think, oh, no biggie, we can just add this to our work already. Please don't, <laughs> um, because you have a lot of tasks that you already have. You already have a lot of hats on, uh, you are already doing probably more than a full-time job. Don't try to do this on your own. Um, but if you do try to do this, you add other resources, you really need to control your scope. You need to control what your expectations are in terms of what you can do and make sure that it matches um, a lot of your scope. Uh, next slide, please. We might ask also, what is publishing? What is OER publishing? Um, I would encourage you to dream really big. Um, dream about the kinds of learning resources that that instructors will use at your institution. Um, these can be books. They don't have to be books, though. They can be problem sets. They can be software. They can be slides. They can be assessment tools, AI prompts, VR, AR, really anything that you can document um, is can be valuable in, in a course. Um, so any kind of creative work, any kind of, of documented work. Next slide, please. Uh, thirdly, educational publishing options. You have a couple different options on a, a spectrum. Um, you have a snapshot in time, 
you have a flexible format that someone can change two hours before class or two minutes before class or in class. <laughs> um, so both of these extremes have value. The snapshot is predictable. The flexible format helps with currency. Maybe you'll do both. Maybe you'll choose, we're gonna focus on just the publishing, the static view, the predictable, high level of polish, um, you know, works for print, um, or maybe you'll say, well, we really want to do the flexible because who knows when the next country will join NATO. Um, Sweden joined NATO in March 2024. Uh, is that reflected in any of the major course materials? So um, teaching happens if you teach, you know it happens on your toes. Uh, you know that uh, there are a lot of things that you decide as you're, as you're teaching about what works and what doesn't work. Um, so think about these two, two um, ends of the spectrum uh, and maybe, maybe you'll end up doing both. Uh, next slide, please. There's a, another kind of dichotomy, and none of these are really uh, true dichotomy, uh, but differentiating really the traditional versus a really innovative um, publishing workflow. Uh, so some some folks will will describe a um, publishing workflow as we did it, it's done, uh, we're going to put it behind us. Um, others will say, okay we're designing this to be repeated because we know that we or someone else will want to make another version. So with OER, source files are really valuable. Um, we designed for repetition, for, for new versions, for um, remixed versions. Um, different than traditional publishing, um, authors who have less experience need more support. Um, that That is a pretty straightforward um, uh, pretty pretty easy to understand, but difficult to know what to do. Um, and then I would also argue that that OER requires a lot more design, um, a lot more um, multi um, different ways of viewing things than uh, traditionally published work, which might be some text and some pictures, but less uh, figures that are reinforcing concepts for specifically for learning. So I show two different workflows. One is very linear. The other one is chunky and it's kind of a mess and it has um, design all over the place. It has project management even before and after the end of a, a creation project. Um, so lots of different steps here, things going on at the same time, um, but can be it can be really valuable to think about um, how these may be different. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, let's talk about labor because we know that books do not write themselves, videos do not create themselves. Um, we have in our group um, just two FTE, um, which I know for some people is like, wow, you have that. That's really great. Um, it is really great. Uh, and um, we look for people who are reliable, who are team oriented, who are efficient, who have really strong problem solving skills. Um, we used to work with Virginia Tech Publishing. They coordinate, um, have coordinated copy editing and layout, but there were some projects they wouldn't support that we wanted to do. So we developed our own publishing capacities. And um, right now we're, we're kind of at a, um, at a crossroads. We'll see what happens in the future. Um, so that is a, is potentially a support for us. Um, it does add some complexity though. Um, next slide, please. And then tools of publishing. Um, I've included a link here for lots of different things you are welcome to, um, to take a look at. Um, uh, there's, there are, um, not in this link, but there are platforms um, because every kind of information needs to be in some kind of container. Um, there are project process and project management checklists, um, templates for agreements, um, different kinds of tools for reviewing course materials, uh, lots of different strategies for, for people and process management. Um, most of them things we've developed ground up. Um, so uh, just as a, a last slide, also next slide, please. Um, you can do this. Um, we have created lots of different things over the last um, eight or so years. And um, some of them are things that we're 
uh, like our, our very first book was in Microsoft Word, <laughs> like not great, don't recommend it, but it was a start, right? So um, this is years of learning, of trying to understand how to best do this work, how to do it in a way that is, um, that's equitable, that is interesting, that does support our faculty, um, especially if they are not quite ready for this. Um, just trying to trying to get people to the finish line is is really um, one of the things that we we try to do. Doesn't always work, but that's what we try to do. So, um, thanks for your time today, and I look forward to the discussion sessions. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I um, will reintroduce Teresa. This is I'll, I'll chalk it up to to growing pains of a new event format. Um, so sorry about that. I, um, I skipped right on over uh, Teresa's time because um, there weren't slides. So um, I'm gonna just quickly scroll back to where we have her name and position and I will hand it over to Teresa. My apologies for the, the mix up there. No problem. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, my name is Teresa Dooley. I am the Student Success and Open Education Librarian at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Um, I've been a librarian here at UMass since 2022, um, but in my past life, I worked in journal publishing as a managing editor, um, which I always think is important to share people share with people when I'm talking about how to do this work, because I want to be very transparent that I have 10 years of experience before coming here to talk about OER. Um, so I didn't just show up and dive into OER. <laughs> Um, so first and foremost, I want to talk about what is OER adoption, right? Um, and in a nutshell, um, it's going to mean finding openly licensed materials that can be used as they currently stand um, in a course. Um, that can be an open textbook, it's what, often what we consider, um, but can also include um, a syllabus or assignments, test banks, um, a data set, open access articles, um, or even content that's in the public domain. Um, so there's a lot of different ways for us to think of OER. Um, and I just like to kind of make, again, make sure that that's front and center. Um, so here at UMass Amherst, we have an established uh, open education grant incentive program. Um, it was established in 2011, um, and we've distributed about $250,000 since 2011 um, in that time, and we have a total of about $3 million in one-time cost savings uh, for students in that time. Um, but it's always important to note that the average grant size that we've awarded is only $2,000. And I know that $2,000 is a lot for people who don't have money, but keep in mind that our normal grants are not $10,000, dollars $20,000. Um, so again, I'd like to make sure people know, think about that. Um, so when I talk about OER adoption, I think that people often think of it as the easy lift um, or, you know, the, the way to get the foot in the door. And it is. Um, but I always like to make sure, um, speaking about our grant program, when I'm talking to faculty and we're trying to build budgets, what I try to explain to them is that they are worthy of incentives <laughs> um, and that even if we can do the searching for them and we can like, we can do the work and they don't need to put in any extra costs, um, and historically, we've given faculty $500 for just looking and finding an existing OER that they can use in their classes. Um, previous feedback from the last couple of years is telling us that $500 isn't enough to do that. Um, so I'm continuing to make the case to increase that. In next year's grant cycle, I hope to award them $1,000 for adoption. Um, but again, uh, it all kind of speaks to data points, which I'll talk about in the next, uh, in, later on in my uh, conversation. Um, so again, thinking about all of that and reminding people that even if they're working with the libraries and campus and, and the campus resources and they don't have money to spend on OER, reminding ourselves, our administrators and our faculty that even if it falls in their job description, that they should be revising their course materials, um, we still want to help them out because we're asking quite a bit of them. Um, which brings me to my next point. When you're building or scaling or sustaining an OER program, you really have to know and understand where faculty are coming from. Um, if they're a new faculty member, they're overwhelmed. 
Um, you know, they have the ideals um, versus the realities of teaching. It's scary. Um, and if they're an established faculty member, chances are that they know the materials that they're using and their courses are designed around them. Um, oftentimes, they have long-term relationships with publishers that are not evil. <laughs> they're helpful, helpful and mutually beneficial. Um, publishers are able to provide really fantastic editorial technology support, um, automatic grading, which is an absolutely must have when you're working with a physics professor who has a thousand students every semester. Um, so really thinking about what their teaching goals are and why they're using the materials that they're using before you go in and try to sell something else is just essential. Um, and I, and it, <laughs> And that for that to happen, you just you need to be talking to faculty. You need to be engaged in your campus. You need to be a part of faculty groups. Um, and I know I'll talk about this in the breakout room, hopefully. But one of the things that I'm hoping to do, because again, we've got people who've been winning awards through our program since 2011. And every time they accept the award, they basically commit to being future reviewers and to be community activists, basically, for OER. Um, and historically, I have not been tapping into that. So again, I'm still new trying not to, I can't do everything. Um, so that's one of the ways that I really hope to be expanding um, to continue helping OER adoption. Um, because the important part here is that we as individuals cannot do everything. <laughs> um, and those the ability to rely on other faculty and those kind of faculty networks, um, it helps us um, learn and share our knowledge about how to tie OER adoption into their teaching goals, their professional development, um, and really explaining to them that their students are not the only ones that benefit from OER. So the next point I really want to make sure we touch on is to build your team. <laughs> um, and I know that's hard because I know I am, I think, the only person um, in the entire University of Massachusetts Amherst that has OER written into my job description. Um, so I encourage you to collaborate whenever and however possible. Um, I'm very lucky here at UMass. I have the ability to collaborate with liaison librarians and selectors so I can understand subject topic, subject specific topics. Um, they help me with generate with they help me generate um, alternate alternative search terms when I'm doing searches. Um, it makes they again, they know all they know very industry specific resources that might not be billed as an OER that are OER. <laughs> So again, really, that is that's really helpful. And other people have already mentioned that collaborating with people like instructional design and your centers for teaching and learning, that's absolutely essential. Um, but I would take that a step further and even collaborate with student groups. Um, here in Massachusetts, again, I know that we're really a step ahead. We have a group called MassPerg, um, which is the Massachusetts Public Interest Research Group. And I know I'm from New York and not, New York also has their version of it. So I don't know if every state has that. Um, but their, one of their tenants is textbook affordability. So I work with them a lot in promotion and outreach. And what I always say is like, they can talk to their faculty, they can talk to their administrators, but most importantly is that our students are the future researchers and teachers and practitioners in the world. They're only students for what, between four, maybe eight years. Um, and then they're, like, they're the ones that can take this and really bring it forward. So don't under, don't discount working with student groups. Um, and then finally, my next point is that everything is a data point, whether you are getting just starting out um, or you're trying to scale a program and expand it, um, keep track of everything. Um, it's how many people attend every workshop, how many people are enrolled in classes before OER adoption and then after OER adoption, track those grades over time. Um, it's all important. Um, and we are constantly going to need to validate our existence and really tell the story about why this work matters. Um, and I'll tell you right now that your administrators are going to change in your professional career. And what mattered to one chancellor or dean might not be a priority for the next one. So you're going to be continuously making these points over and over again. I know it's exhausting. I know it's frustrating. <laughs> I'm going through it right now. Um, just keep track of that data um, because it's so much harder to go back in and try to find it. Um, and of course, when people are requesting this material from you, they want it quickly and they want it clearly. Um, so just really try to build that into everything you're doing, um, even if you're looking at OER adoption as a way to kind of like, again, do that easy lift. Um, we cannot assume that people are aware of the benefits. 
And when I'm talking about data collection, you know, we have a ton of stuff on the national and international levels. We know overall the effects that can have, but being able to track that to your own institution is really important. Um, I think I'm already over my time. So I'm gonna go ahead and say thank you. Um, and again, I'm looking forward to speak to anybody about any more of this in the breakout rooms. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, thank you to all our presenters uh, for, for sharing your, your wisdom and ideas. And I know everyone is looking forward to discussing more in the breakout rooms. So I will get us queued up for that. Um, we are going to um, offer a couple different options for breakout rooms um, and you'll be able to self-select into your room sort of based on size of institution. Um, if you'd rather not participate in the breakout session, no worries. You can either join our quiet space room where you can remain with cameras off and microphones muted. Um, so it's a good place to go if you've had a busy day and just need a minute to regroup. Um, and then we'll come back uh, to the big group for our community debrief um, at 12.50. Um, so for all the rooms except for the quiet space, when you get to the room, we encourage you to assign um, a, a note taker um, on the slides, which we're going to put in the chat as well. Um, and then somebody who is brave enough to report back to the group when we do our community debrief. And then keep in mind, you can use the chat in your breakout room and only the group members will see it. So if you have any difficulties or need help, you can send um, a private chat, chat to OEN staff members, um, Barb and Lorraine. Um, so even if they aren't in your breakout room, they'll be able to see it and can jump in and help. 